Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. My name's Caroline, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, by rights, I should be drunk. And so just for today, as I was thinking on my way up here, what a miracle, what a miracle that I am sober today and that all of us ex-drunks are sober today. And uh, I just want to say, you know, who but a sober bunch of alcoholics could have given us such a wonderful lunch and thank you very much. Beautifully organized. And isn't it amazing, really, if you think of, of yeah, well, most of us couldn't organize our way out of a paper bag by the time we came into this fellowship. So um, I don't think I've ever had so long to speak at a meeting. So I thought, well, you're going to get my story. So, um, so here it comes. Uh, as I said, I am an alcoholic. I know I don't look like one today. But there is no doubt in my mind that I have a physical allergy to alcohol and that I had a mental obsession that will kill me. And um, that started for me very early on. As you can tell from my voice, born with a fairly silver spoon in my mouth, and um, to a very, you know, proper family with a good education and all the advantages in life, really. And I remember one of the things I thought at the end of my drinking, why am I such a failure because I knew I'd been given so much, and I knew I felt emotional today. So, um, but I was given really everything in, in many ways. And uh, so there is no, with alcoholism, I often hear people saying, well, I had to find out why I drank. There was no reason why I drank. I had a physical allergy, and I was sick as a parrot when I picked up my first drink. I was already, emo- and so I drink on anything as an alcoholic. There are no specific things that make me drink, but the insanity of my disease. And, um, you know, for me, my parents divorced, and emotionally, it was one of those families where I've heard it said so often, you know, my parents got divorced, I never saw them row, not once, never saw a fight. I was brought up by a nanny in a nursery and, um, you know, emotional constipation. My younger brother was going back to boarding school and uh, I was crying. And nanny said, what are you crying for? You're not going back to school. And so I learned very early on, you don't show emotion. You don't talk about how you are. You don't communicate with other human beings. That just isn't acceptable. And um, by the time I was... And I say all this in hindsight. This is what I discovered at my fourth and fifth step. This isn't psychobabble. This is just what I had to discover about myself. Because if I don't know myself and the damage that was done, how do I, how do I get well? And one of the things that I learned as a child was I wasn't lovable. That's what I thought. And I've had to deal with that like so many alcoholics by the time I came into AA. It was something that was very ingrained in me. God can't love me. People can't love me. I'm not lovable. And so that was something I saw in my fourth and fifth. And and that's why these steps are so important for me, was discovering what it was that went on in my past. For all sorts of reasons. Anyway... So by the time I was eight, I was emotionally, I didn't really feel. And uh, so I was switched off and I didn't talk about anything. And I was really a deeply unhappy child. But I didn't know I was. If you'd asked me when I came into AA, what was your childhood like? I'd have said, oh, it was all right. Because what else did we know? I wasn't abused. I wasn't beaten. There was nothing awful. I was just deeply unhappy. And, And... you know, why is it, you know, is it alcohol? Is it, you know, I went to school. I always felt different. I felt different because the village school didn't, they didn't have ponies and I did. I felt different if I went to grander people because they had grander houses than us. I felt different if somebody was clever. I felt everything. I never felt the same as others. And, and why? 
I don't know, I can't tell you, I just need to know that's how I felt. And um, I had my first, actually my first drink I think was at my father's wedding, and uh, I thought that was wonderful. But then all my brothers and sisters did too, we were all running around a bit drunk on champagne, and we thought that was marvellous. So, you know, no different to anybody else. My next drink was at boarding school, and it was neat gin and neat vodka. I don't know who bought it in, and I was about 13. And that was the answer to my prayers. Well, I didn't actually pray, but that was the answer to whatever my problems were, because it made me feel good. Just that simple. I felt wonderful drunk. You know, I was suicide. I wanted to commit suicide by the time I was about 13. I used to sit on my bedroom window at school wishing I could jump out. Um, and, uh, and, and drink for me meant happiness. And of course, how quickly did my problems learn to swim? And, uh, I couldn't drink every day, but I had a physical allergy and, and, and we're all different, obviously. But for me, alcoholism took me, um, it took, <laughs> I'm thinking of an expression that isn't, but it took me very quickly. Um, I was, I was off. It, it had me in its grips very, very quickly. And if I could have drunk every day at that point, I would have done, I think. And, um, and it was interesting. I was, I was taking the dog for a walk yesterday, and I was thinking about, well, you know, what's relevant in my life story? Because obviously, otherwise, I don't want to be giving you all a fourth and fifth step. And I thought I was going to have to speak for an hour. And I said, it's an awful long time. Anyway, I'll try not to speak for an hour. And, um, and I... I saw suddenly very clearly how at that age I'd go home and there'd be these parties and I was always the one that was drunk. And I was always the one that was having to be lifted up off the floor or was being sick or was... And I was in trouble so quickly with alcohol, you know, or in a, inappropriate situations, in bed with some sort of... Anyway... You don't want to know that it's not my fifth step, but it was very sordid, very early, let me assure you. And, um, and so when I was young, that was quite funny. But as I began to get older, it was no longer funny being drunk because I did things that I was ashamed of drunk. And I began to realize that drinking had consequences and I didn't like them very much. And, and one of my things was learned from child control. You know, never let anybody see what's going on. So for me, being drunk as I got older, I hated it because I was out of control. And so I was scared of it. And I'm not going to talk very long, but you know, I, I discovered drugs. I've been taking drugs on and off with the alcohol, but I, I actually discovered I got into heavy drugs and I was a heroin addict because I thought I could control that better than I could alcohol. I didn't do the things on drugs that I did drunk. On drugs, I could be at home and just be mm, stoned, and there were no feelings, there were no nothing. Drunk, I did things that were embarrassing, shameful, very bad hangovers, or alcohol poisoning is probably more what it's called. So, you know, it had consequences that the drug-taking didn't appear to have but then I would try and give up the drugs and then I would drink and then I would take and you know people say well, we lived in the past or the future now I lived in the day fairly much because it was always never in the moment because why would I want to look back in the past that was not good looking back in the forward well that was I don't know why I didn't look back in the look into the I was thinking this the other day but I, it was always about how do I get out of how, do, how I feel at this moment. I couldn't live in the reality of this moment. And I was the same for some time when I first came into AA. I lived in fantasy because I couldn't deal with reality. The reality of how I was. It was a very unpleasant place, so I never felt, I never thought, I never used my brain, I, I never did. And, and by the end of my drinking, I honestly, I remember there was a time in, in, I was abroad and I couldn't get drugs and I couldn't, it was middle of the day and I, I just didn't even think of drinking for some reason. And I was in this park and I thought, and I knew I was just a walking zombie. 
That's what I became by my drinking. I was just this sort of zombie. And there was no life in me. There was, I didn't know what joy was. You know, when I first came, people used to say, oh, you'll be happy. And it's like, well, what's that? You know, how many of us know what happiness is before we come in these rooms? I'm not sure I know what it is today, but I know what joy is today. I know what it is to be alive today. But I didn't. By the end of my drinking, I just wanted to be dead. And I was 24 years old. And why does that make me want to cry? I don't know. Sometimes it just does. Because how tragic is this disease of alcoholism? Us here, we're the lucky ones. So many of my, quote, friends are dead today from this disease. Why have I been given the gift of sobriety? I don't know, but I sure as heck had better be grateful for it because it is a gift and that, that there is no doubt in my mind. And I want, I want the best from my sobriety and half measures avail me nothing. I don't want to die from this disease. I have, God has given me a gift and I want to use it to the, to the most, to the best. I was, I remember my sponsor saying, who also came in when she was 24, 25, and she realized that if she were to die sober, she might have to stay sober a jolly long time and she'd better get it right. And I remember thinking the same thing. Yeah, if I'm going to stay sober a long time, I'd better get it right. And I hope just for today that I have. I know I'm sober just for today. I know I'm deeply imperfect. And I know I often don't get it quite right. I don't get it wrong. My sponsor doesn't let me get it wrong. I just don't get it quite right. And I'm going to get a stiff neck because this is too short for me. <laughs> so... By the time I came into a, by the time I was 24, I was unemployable. I'd had the sack from really most of my jobs. Nobody wanted to employ me. I, somebody said to me, they said, you poison the atmosphere in this office. What a thing to say. But he was right. Alcoholism didn't make me nice. I was selfish, self-centered to the very core and I liked you if you could give me something. And if you weren't going to give me anything, there was nothing in it for me, I wasn't interested. That was me. That was my alcoholism. If you were nicer than that, great. But I wasn't. And, um, and so by the time I was unemployable, and uh, I was actually 12 step first of all, into a, a fellowship called Narcotics Anonymous, which many of you I'm sure will have heard of. And I went to it, and I was gripped, and there was nothing anonymous about it. There were at least ten people from my school were there that I'd been at school with. And they all went off to a dinner party, leaving me. So what would I do? I had a resentment, so of course I drank and took drugs. But I did try. I could see, I could see they had something that I wanted. And so I did try, but I couldn't, I didn't understand them. Because although I had taken drugs, I am in here, up here, an alcoholic. And I do not think the same as addicts. And I am sharing my experience. I do not think the same. And I couldn't get sober there. And they were very good to me. And then they'd all been in treatment. This was when NA, this was, you know, a long time ago. NA had only just started. And they'd all been in treatment. So I thought, well, perhaps if I go into treatment, they all wanted me to go into treatment because I couldn't say so. Perhaps if I go into treatment, then I'll get it because I'll be like them. I'll belong. I so by this stage wanted to belong. I'd never belonged anywhere in my life. And I could see that this was a fellowship worth belonging to. So they, they had something. So... I went into treatment, and I was there for six weeks. And when I first went in, I looked out the window and thought, no wonder they've got bars at the window. Why wouldn't you want to jump out of it? 
and um you know the, uh, yeah and by the end of course i was very happy very happy ultimate insanity being happy in a nut house well i you know i was very happy there because it was safe it was safe i didn't have to cope with the reality of the real world and there were people like me and we had fun. it was good and they said well we'll do a step forward and they you know i nearly had a thing that i had to stand up and say i'm not at a garden party i'm here to get well and i'm very sick alcoholic so um <laughs> that's what i was like and you know i didn't have step one i didn't know how sick i was you know i'd been insane for a very long time that was just normal wasn't it how you know how my head was and um I did say this quickly, you know, I listened to people's chairs in AA and I listened to le much lower rock bottoms than me. And I see that there's a progression in this disease and there is a place where something happens in the alcoholic. I talked to somebody earlier where it no longer matters who knows where you, whether you drink, you no longer stop trying to hide it or disguise it or something just goes. And I didn't get to that stage I was at that stage where it was about to happen and I don't know whether I would have killed myself first because certainly I, I wanted to but I was very lucky I didn't get to that stage yet just for today so um, I can't remember why I said that yeah because I didn't have step one I didn't think I was that bad and they said, give two examples, and then I had to do the step four, and they said, give two examples of selfishness. And I'm thinking about it, and I spend a day, and I talk to other people about it. Can you all, is, this, I, I'm not, is it all right, my speaking as I am? And it took me two days to find two examples of selfishness. And one of them was I made my boyfriend turn over from the sport to a movie. I had not a clue. I was not in the real world, let me assure you. And my higher power, well, I, I think I thought a tree would be quite nice. And I realized, of course, I was going to leave this treatment center and the tree was going to be left behind too. So um, I think I vaguely believed there was something there. But I, you know, if, if you don't have step one, why are you going to believe in God? You don't need to, do you? Well, I didn't. If I don't believe I'm really powerless, why do I need a God? Because I was God, really. So, uh, so, so left treatment, but I left with great hope. And that was the thing it gave me, was a great hope for the future, that I could be well. I'd had, you know, four or five weeks in there where I'd been, I'd known happiness such as I had never known, or, or certainly not known for a very long time, the hope for the future, that life could be good. It didn't have to be this awful, sordid, disastrous, miserable existence. You know, I, I could say, did I have some good times drinking? Well, yes, I suppose I did. But there were always consequences. Always. And my problems, as I say, did learn to drink very... It, my <laughs> problems did learn to swim very quickly. You know, I was still paranoid, drunk. He didn't like me, she didn't like me, he didn't say good morning in the right place, I had a bad day. You know, the, it, it was all there. And it, anyway, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm leaving treatment now and um, yep, num AA is going to be my number one. Sobriety is my number one priority. And men, no, no. And uh, I'll go to lots of meetings and they'd given me this sponsor who I'd been at school with. Goody, goody two shoes, I thought she was. And um, that was when we talked, and she was very nice. She was very nice, but she used to ask me how I felt. No, rude question. We don't go there. I don't know how I feel, and I'm certainly not going to tell anybody if I did. So, um, so I didn't really connect with a sponsor. I did go to quite a lot of AA meetings, but things happen, don't they? It was my number one priority for a few months and I began to get, you know, people began to ask me places and, and I got a job and, you know, life began to get back to, or it was never normal, but began to have, uh, well, life began to happen. 
And so if you haven't got step one, where is AA going to go? Well, life is going to, quote, take precedence over AA, isn't it? And then, of course, you know, I don't have a higher power. I don't have a trust in God. I don't have anyone I can talk to. So I'm a woman, aren't I? What am I? I need a man. Because I need a higher power, and that's going to be a man, and he's got to be perfect. So I got a man. He was married, but, you know, hey. And I was amoral. I knew his wife. I knew his whole family. And it didn't really occur to me there was anything very wrong with that. I can't believe it today, but yeah, that's where I was at. And so, well, guess what, of course, you know, hey, he wasn't perfect. Surprise, surprise. He couldn't spoil me and make me happy and give me everything I wanted every moment of the day and do everything that he should do. And um, and so, uh, and then my sponsor, then I think I was, what happened then? I can't, isn't it awful? It's so long ago. Well, the inevitable happened, didn't it? I picked up a drink. And that happened, funnily enough, not the relationship actually, relationship, the affair ended for some reason or another. I can't remember what it was. And I got through the drama. Don't we just love a good drama, us alcoholics? And I can really deal with the drama. You know, I can, I had cancer not so long ago. Oh, I really dealt with that well, but give me a nasty cold and I'm off the program. But anyway, so we got through the drama and everybody was really nice about it and poor me. Mm -mm -mm. And then, of course, that all went, didn't it? And I was left just with the reality of me again. And I couldn't handle it. I hadn't changed. Not one thing had I changed about myself. Not really. I just wasn't drinking. And the problem is with the alcoholic, you know, we can stop drinking, but we can't stay stopped. And why can't I stay stopped? Because of what's up here. And so um, I went away for this weekend with, with, with friends and, uh, well, acquaintances anyway. And, <clears throat> and they were all drinking and they mixed up this wonderful alcoholic cocktail. And they all said, oh, this is really good. And the host was an alcoholic. He has died from this disease. And I thought, well, why haven't they mixed me one? Excuse me. Mm -mm -mm. So I thought, well, I'm going to try theirs. So I did the first day. Well, I got away with that. So I thought, well, the second day, I'll try that again. And I was off. And they'd gone into lunch, and I was finishing up their glasses. And I, and I didn't even, there was no, you know, there was no mental defense against the first drink. I had no mental defense because I had not been working this program or coming to enough meetings, or anything else. So I had, there was no mental defense. I wanted to drink, I had one. That was that. So, and I was caught with my lips to the jug. And um, so I went into lunch, and I sat down, and there was all this wine on the table, and, and I had a moment of sanity. And for the first time, something went from there to there. And I knew I was an alcoholic. I knew I wanted to drink like an alcoholic. I knew I wanted to get drunk like most of them didn't. And I knew, most importantly, that I was powerless. And that if I got drunk, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I was scared. And I left that room and I went upstairs to my room. There were no mobile phones in those days. And I got on my knees to a God that I really was fairly indifferent to. But I got on my knees and I begged him for the gift of sobriety, not to let me get drunk that day. And I haven't had a drink from that day. And every day I have asked a God of my understanding to keep me sober, keep me free from that desire to drink, take a drink or a drug, because what a freedom it is. And may I never underestimate that freedom that I can get up in the morning and I don't want to drink. And I'm not suffering from the consequences of drink. And that I can go to work 
and I don't need a drink to deal with the problems. I have to, I was just, it's, it's dry, but I, you know, I worked at Christie's once, and I, I remember going, we used to go down to the um, book department to score. I <laughs> don't know why that came to my head, but that was my work. But I remember that, that thing I couldn't get through the day without a chemical, a drug, or a drink. Just couldn't do it. So what a freedom. And um, I don't know what time I started. So when I go on too long, please, somebody is going to have to, because I have no idea now. Um, so, no, so here I was in AA, happy ever after, you would think. But no, it's been a hard, it's not easy. It's not easy getting sober. It's not easy working this program one day at a time. Life isn't easy for those out there, so why should it be necessarily easy for us? But we, I believe, that we have gifts and joys that your average civilian doesn't have. Because every day I wake up, or if I don't, I work on it, I wake up being grateful for the new day. I remember when I was about oh, nine months sober, and I suddenly realized I was happy to be alive. And I hadn't realized that I had never been happy to be alive. What a joy that is. And so I started to, I went back to my sponsor and started to work through the steps. I had the first part of step one. Did I truly understand the unmanageability? Not sure I did. Did I truly understand how sick I was? You know, I was going to start this chair off with, I'm damaged goods. And it's true. That is what I am. But if I work this program, God makes me into something. I, I hesitate to say special. That sounds awful, doesn't it? But compared to where I came from, believe me, it's special. So I can call it special. But um, And so, you know, step two and three, well, insanity. I did not. What's insanity? And I, I remember early on, I had to do a chair on step two. And I thought, mm, well, how am I going to do this? I didn't really understand the insanity of my deeds. I, it had always, my head had always been insane. But of course, very simply, insanity is expecting, you know, picking up a drink and expecting a different result. That's a pretty good insanity. Making the same mistakes and expecting a different result. Of course, there's a lot more to it than that. But that is the simplistic, you know, the insanity... I mix it with the unmanageability. And it wasn't until I'd done a step four and five that I really understood what the unmanageability and the insanity was. Perhaps because I had a high rock bottom, I don't know. So although I'd done a four and five in treatment, that was obviously woefully inadequate with only two examples of selfishness. And uh, so my sponsor set me to do another one. And my sponsor did it the life story way, so that's the way I did it. You know, all the, it, it doesn't matter how you do it as long as it all comes out. That's what's important. And, um, and we sat down to do the fifth step. I'd done this life story. I've done my best to be honest. And we're getting through it. And, oh, something hurts. I have a sort of feeling, oh, I want to cry. So I run upstairs to the bathroom, <laughs> have a cry, and then come back down again like this. <laughs> And my sponsor in the end, thank God, says to me, she says, this is not a proper fourth, fifth step. You know, if I'm not willing to trust another human being with my emotions, another alcoholic with my emotions, I am not going to do an adequate fifth step for me. I had to learn to trust her. First God, then another human being. And I just certainly didn't trust God because I didn't think he loved me. I knew I wasn't lovable. So I had to go away again. And, and more important, perhaps, I didn't realize, I think, the, how important it was to get everything out, to get the emotions out, to have everything out in the open, to discuss the pains, the whatevers, of the, you know. So um, I had to go away and pray and pray and pray and pray for the willingness the willingness to be rigorously 
honest and how hard do most of us, well, I think I'll share it for myself, how hard do I find that rigorous honesty about myself? You know, I got back from holiday uh, just, just recently and, you know, you can, it's so easy to justify things, really. I was lazy about my spiritual life. I'd rather read a good book in the morning than do my own readings, but it was like, I'm on holiday, I need a rest. But, you know, if I'd taken my inventory and been rigorously honest, you're being a lazy cow cow, and, and I'd have felt a lot better if I had done the things I should have done. But, you know, I take these little holidays sometimes, and I normally pay for them. So, um, as long as I don't pick up a drink. Anyway, but it, it, I can't remember why that came in. Anyway, so, so I did another four-step eventually. Somehow the penny dropped, and I, I knew I was going to have to trust her and cry in front of somebody else and trust them with my emotions. And, um, and so I did another fourth and fifth. And uh, my current sponsor actually said it was Grimm's Fairy Tales, but it was the best I could do, and I thought it was honest at the time. But, uh, well, what can I say? Anyway, but at the end of that fifth step, as I think I said before, I, I saw my alcoholism utterly and completely. I saw my nothingness. I saw the extent of my disease, my sickness. And I saw that I could not make myself well. And, and one of the results of a fourth and fifth is ego deflation at depth. And I believe that is what has happened to me at the end of that fourth and fifth. I remember I'd got to the end and my sponsor read out this list of defects and I, I'm so grateful that I was honest with her and so it's like you're talking about somebody else. Ego was back up. I don't, excuse me. Mm -mm -mm. I could feel it. wasn't conscious it was there. And she said, Caroline, she said, I can't make yourself see yourself as you truly are. I, she said, it's between you and God and she left the room. And I knew it was between God answering a prayer and me going down the off license because there was one at the bottom of her road. So I now get on my knees and I beg God for the gift to see my... Whenever I beg God, you know, he never lets me down. I just don't beg often enough. And I begged God for the grace to see myself as I truly was. And, you know, it was... And I got the grace and it was such a relief. You know, I knew I was horrible. <laughs> Really, I knew I wasn't very nice. And it was such a relief to have acknowledged that, to have acknowledged all my selfishness, my cruelty, my unpleasantness, my whatever, pain, whatever, and the, th the things I'd inflicted on other people. And it was, I just felt this huge sense of relief. And... um my sponsor told me to go away and do six and seven. Well, why wouldn't I want to do six and seven after seeing all that? Why wouldn't I want to give God permission to make me well, to take away my defects, my shortcomings? What, there wasn't one I wanted to keep. They'd caused me nothing but misery. So six and seven came very naturally after that which I believe if you do a good fourth and fifth, it does. So, um, which brings us to, um, you know, eight and nine. Eight for me is not just a list. You know, it talks about in the 12 by 12. I had to re-examine my relationships with what my sponsor calls a flea comb and really look closely at the relationships, the things that have separated me from the human race, from God, whatever, really look closely at it, at the relationship with my mother, father, brothers, whoever it is. Because the better I understand my disease and what it's done to me, the better, and, and my relationships with other people and the things that do me damage and other people damage, 
and getting free. You know, one of the things with my mother was the hatred that had to come out. And I had to say this now, I think I was seven, eight years sober before that happened. And then underneath the hatred, I discovered I loved her deeply. And what a lovely thing that was. And, and again, this is only my story. It took me, I think it was when I, I did eight steps again with my uh, second sponsor. My first sponsor is actually now a nun, which I don't know why God didn't want me to be a nun, but he didn't, so there you go. And um, my sponsor took me through step eight the second time. And I, it was because my emotions were so completely buried, it took that long for them to come out. And oh, it was such a joy to feel pain because I knew I was then truly getting well. I was really, truly now a human being. I could feel pain and I could feel joy and I could love genuinely other human beings. And I love my fellow alcoholics. I may not like you all sometimes, but on the whole, actually, I do like alcoholics. It's not that I don't like you. It's I don't like some of the things that you do to me, of course. You know, I've come down from my home group and nine people came with me. And that is, what a wonderful thing. So grateful. And I got sober in London, actually. And it's, you know, there wasn't that kind of fellowship. And coming down to Newbury and knowing everybody, it's been actually a, a really lovely experience for me in London. You know, you don't like what's going on. So you go to another meeting. And it's so huge, and there's so there for me, there's never been that kind of fellowship I've had down here, and it's been a, a, a wonderful privilege to be part of it and watch so many people get well. The little group there, they're over there, that's our so, um, so yes, yeah, so step eight and nine. I was very young, I didn't live with anybody. Did I do a lot of the damage to other people? They didn't hang about, you know, people just left. So I did have amends to make. I did obviously have to ring my, one of the hardest things was my, my sponsor said, now ring your father and tell him you love him. And, you know, we didn't come from that kind of background. So I ring my father saying, you know, Dad, I'm sorry, I haven't been the daughter that I could have been and should have been. And um, this makes me cry. <laughs> and I love you. And he didn't know what to say. You know, he was so sort of taken aback. And he died last year. And we never did have a wonderful, marvellous relationship, but we had the best relationship that we could have had. And some years later, we're sitting watching this programme called Casualty, and this man's dying on the table, and this father, this is a surgeon, and, um, and the surgeon's never told this son that he loves him. And um, Anyway, so I turned to my father and said, do you love me, Dad? Because he didn't tell me that he did. Nobody ever told anybody in my family that we loved each other. And... Uh, it's so silly. <laughs> so I said, no, do you love me? And then my stepmother got in. She said, no, you t- do you love her? And in the end, he said, of course I love you, and I'm so proud of you. You know, because I have learned to communicate in AA. Isn't it so important to be able to share with your fellow human being, how you feel, and be able to talk to them about how they feel, and to be able to be open. I don't have to be like this anymore, typical English stiff upper lip. So that's why I cried when I talked. But um, although we know, as I say, we didn't have this very close, but we had the best relationship we could. And, um, and so that is the gift of sobriety. So 10 and 11 and 12, well, I better sure as heck make sure I do that every day. And some days I do it better than others. God, I became a Catholic when I was two years sober. Please, all the aunties, don't get up and speak at once. Um, I am a convert. I wasn't brought up as a Catholic. I said to God, where do you want me? And that's where he took me, and I've been very happy there ever since and that's just my experience and um and so step 10 11 and 12 well step 10 is the the more i understand my weakness in a way the more i see my nothingness my defects my the more i understand my need for god of my you know step seven of myself i am nothing the father 
doeth the works. I don't have to make myself well, thank God. I cannot keep myself sober. I cannot remove my defects. And for me, there is no joy in my life without a faith in God. And in step 11, I do try and improve my conscious contact with him. I talk to him when I walk the dogs. I say prayers. I try and meditate. Not very good at it. Very distracted. You know, the Our Father and about that dress I was making, you know, whatever it is. But, but I keep trying, you know, trudge the road of happy destiny. Well, I keep trudging, thank God, one day at a time. So um, I think I must have spoken for long enough now. It is the most, if I could, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to just make everybody well? It is the most wonderful, the most powerful, the most special program that we have. I have been through phases in my sobriety when I did not work it hard enough. When I thought when I underestimated my disease and I nearly drank at 18 years sober because I underestimated my disease and I had my own business and it was all so busy and AA didn't want my sobriety. They didn't want to talk about God. They didn't want to do that. Mm -mm -mm. So instead of finding new meetings, I took that as an opt-out clause. Well, I'm long enough, so I don't need to go to that many. What a mistake. I nearly paid for it with my life. So please, God, one day at a time, I won't make that mistake again. And um, I have a joy of life on the whole. I have difficulties, but the joy of being alive is something that is immeasurable for the alcoholic because by rights I should be dead from this disease. So I thank you all, every alcoholic, we need each other. I can't stay sober without you. You know, it is a fellowship. I've tried staying sober without going to, and it was a dangerous thing. And above all, I thank God for the gifts that he has given me. The most important gift being that of AA. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.